In this video, we're going to see an overview of some of the object-oriented programming features that are available in C++. So specifically, we're going to talk about inheritance, polymorphism, virtual functions, and then pure virtual functions. We're going to focus more on the concepts here versus the code. There's other videos in this module that go over how to actually implement some of these features. So inheritance is used whenever two classes have an is a relationship. So for example, here we have a room. And if we want to implement a kitchen, a kitchen is a room. And so we could use inheritance in that case. That's as opposed to containment, where there's a has a relationship. So here we have an engine, and then a car has a engine. Now there's nothing magical about these two different ways of setting up a relationship between two classes. So for example, we could say that a kitchen has a room, we could set up our code that way. We don't necessarily have to use it that way, but again, containment just means that an object of one class is a data member of another class, whereas inheritance means that there's a parent-child relationship between the two classes. For our engine, we could also use inheritance there where we say that a car is an engine. Now, that's not true in the real world. However, there's nothing stopping us from writing code that way. Again, we want our code to, as best as possible, model what exists in the real world, but the specific details may change depending on what we want to do. So there's more details about this particular topic in the notes. And so if you are unclear about inheritance and containment, definitely make sure you read those. So setting up inheritance in C++, first we need a parent class. So here we have a parent class with two methods. This class is called parent just because it's a parent class, but this parent class would be some generic idea. So here, for example, we could have a virus class, a fruit class, a computer class, or a sandwich class. None of these things are specific enough to be useful on their own, but they very clearly indicate certain categories. So for example, if you go to the doctor to be treated for a virus, the doctor is not going to know how to treat you. They need to know specifically what type of virus. By the same token, if you go on Amazon and order a computer, a computer could mean a lot of different things, and there's a lot of different types of computers. So these are more generic concepts that would be in our class hierarchy, and then we'll create child classes that inherit features from those. So here we have a child class, and it only has one method, method two. So that means that method two is an overloaded method. And again, it extends the parent class. So a child is a parent. For example, COVID-19 is a virus, Apple is a fruit, a MacBook is a computer, and a Reuben is a sandwich. And there's no reason that we have to stop here with our inheritance. So for example, if we take apples, we can have a Honeycrisp apple, a Fiji apple, Golden Delicious apple, or a Gala apple. So in this case, you can see we're taking that parent-child relationship and we're extending it down by another level to be more specific. And of course, as we design this hierarchy, we're going to put the more generic features higher up in the hierarchy. And for example, our Golden Delicious class that should only have things that are specific to a golden delicious apple versus a Honeycrisp. The word polymorphism means taking on many forms. And so in C++, we can declare a parent pointer that can point to a parent object. We could also declare a child pointer that points to a child object. Keep in mind, though, that that child object is made up both of members of the parent class and members of the child class. And the child reference has access to all of them. Now, where polymorphism comes into play is in addition to a parent object, a parent reference can also refer to a child object. And that works because everything that the parent reference knows about is part of a child object. Now it doesn't know about these class members and we can't easily get there from the parent reference. However, anything that would be legal to do with this parent reference would work with a child object. We can also work this in the opposite direction, although you, almost always it is ill-advised to do so. And the reason being is a child reference can refer to a parent object but it only knows about those parent class members. If we try to access a child member using a child reference that's pointing to a child object, then we're gonna run into trouble. Next, let's talk about virtual functions. So before we talk about specifically what they are, we need to talk about why we have them. At some point, a method evocation, where we call a method, has to be tied to a method implementation, where that method is actually defined. Now with early binding, the implementation gets chosen at compile time. So here's an example where I have some shapes and clearly I have three area functions. Well, when I calculate total area here, I'm gonna call the circle area function, the triangle area function, and the square area function. 
And that's all very clear. The compiler can determine this. But let's suppose I'm using polymorphism and I have a shape array that has a circle, triangle, and square. And then in a for each loop, I try to calculate the total area. What area gets called here? And hopefully you can see that the compiler can't necessarily determine at compile time what method to call because it doesn't know what type of shape this is. And even if you said, well, okay, but it can look at the initialization here and know that those three shapes, how does it know though that no shapes are added or removed and that we're not, for example, dynamically letting the user add and remove shapes from that array? So again, there's really no way for it to know. So late binding happens when the method implementation gets chosen at runtime. When this code executes, then it determines what method gets called. And that's what's critical about virtual methods because virtual methods allow you to choose, do you want to do early binding or late binding? So here's an example of a parent class with two virtual methods. Methods two and three are both virtual. And then my child, I'm overriding all three methods. So a child object looks like this. It has the parent class methods and it has the child class methods. So if I have a child object, calling method one, two, or three on that child object will call the child class methods. The same thing happens with a child pointer to a child object. If you call method one, two, three, it calls the child class methods one, two, three. Now keep in mind, method one is non-virtual, methods two and three are virtual. If I have a parent pointer to a child object, methods two and three are virtual, so the child class methods will still get called. However, for method one, since it's non-virtual, that means it's doing early binding, meaning if you call method one with this pointer to a child object, it's going to call the parent class method. Now, why might you want to do that in practice? Well, suppose you're writing a game and you have a class hierarchy. There may be cases where you want to treat all of your game characters as the same thing. In that case, you can use the parent class pointer to have access to the parent class methods. You're treating everything the same as a character in the game. But then for the most part, you're going to want to be treating those things as what they actually are. So in those cases, you would want to use the actual child class methods. Another example is suppose you have a payroll program that has a pay method. Typically, you want to pay everybody the way their class of employee gets paid. Hourly employees, you multiply the hours worked. Salaried employees just get the same amount each time. But then suppose you want to give everybody a bonus. That's just add this much money to everybody's paycheck. In that case, you may want to use this parent pointer to call the parent class pay method that puts a flat amount in to their paycheck. So this is sort of a, an odd concept. And one way to think of it is if you are coming from a Java background, then virtual methods do polymorphism the same way that Java does. It's the non-virtual methods that actually change things up. So finally, we have this idea of pure virtual methods. So here we have our parent class, which is mostly the same as before, except now we have a pure virtual method. And notice it's a virtual method that doesn't have a body. It just is assigned the value of zero. So, the, so method three is a pure virtual function. That makes parent an abstract class. We can instantiate a parent object. So in our child class, notice we implement the non-virtual method one, the virtual method two, and the pure virtual method three. So here you can see our overloaded pure virtual method is method three. That means that now child is a non-abstract class and we can instantiate child objects. Again, if you're coming from a Java background, you can think of a pure virtual function as an abstract method and any class that includes an abstract method is therefore an abstract class and any child class that's not abstract has to override those abstract classes. Okay, so this is a brief overview. There are a lot of examples that going through this material using code. So make sure you have a good understanding of this because it is an important topic in C++.